I'm Dr. Rhonda Stokely, Public Health Dental Director for the state of Texas, and I'm going to be your moderator for tonight's panel. Make sure that you've signed in. You'll see a link to do that in your chat box. Welcome to Ask the Docs about prenatal oral health, safety of dental care during pregnancy. We're happy to have you here with us. This conversation about prenatal oral health is brought to you by the Oral Health Improvement Program at the Texas Department of State Health Services and Cook Children's in Fort Worth. We would like to thank all of our partners who have helped us get the word out about this session. Before we get started, I'd like to explain briefly why we're here. Oral health is an important part of overall health, and that includes prenatal health. Yet in 2017, only a third of pregnant women in Texas even had their teeth cleaned. There's a lot of reasons for this, but tonight we're working towards addressing two of those. We're, we're working towards two solutions tonight with this chat. Number one, prenatal providers need to discuss oral health with their pregnant patients, reassure them that dental care is safe and important and refer them to a dentist. And number two, Dentists need to provide dental care to pregnant patients and not delay care over safety concerns. Good oral health is important for pregnant women because of the associations between poor oral health and negative pregnancy outcomes. It is also important for baby's oral health. Moms can vertically transmit the tooth causing bacteria in their mouth, tooth decay causing bacteria in their mouth to baby through common behaviors just like kisses and sharing spoons. Pregnancy is a teachable moment. Many pregnant women are more concerned about their health than they ever have been before because they want to have a healthy pregnancy and a healthy baby. Dental visits during pregnancy are also an opportunity to discuss the importance of baby's oral health so that moms can get off to a great start caring for baby's teeth. This is the time to tell them that baby needs their first dental visit by age one. So now I'd like to introduce our panelists. Our dental panelist is Dr. Tanya Fuquay, a general dentist with a private practice that she shares with her dentist husband in Southlake. Dr. Fuquay founded and manages Save a Smile, a program led by Cook Children's Medical Center. Save a Smile provides need-based dental services to children throughout Tarrant County. Our prenatal panelist, Dr. Andrea Palmer, is board certified by the American Board of Obstetrics and Gynecology and a fellow of the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. She practices at Phenom's Women's Care at Baylor All Saints in, in Fort Worth. Thanks to both of you for being here with me this evening. So, all right, panelists, question time. My first question. So I just said to everybody in the audience that oral health is important for pregnant women, but only like a third or so of Texas women get their teeth cleaned while they're pregnant. I'd like to hear from both of you from your own perspectives, why you feel oral health care is important for pregnant women. I'll start with Dr. Fuquay and then Dr. Palmer, if you can answer. Okay, great. Thanks, Dr. Stokely. Um, welcome everyone. Um, pregnancy is such a exciting and unique time in a woman's life, um, but characterized with a lot of physiological changes that are occurring um, with that pregnant woman or female and oral health has somehow over the over time been disconnected to overall health so this has been disconnected from the rest of the body and what an opportune time with a pregnant woman to really engage and connect oral health to their overall health and how it impacts themselves and their baby uh, the oral health can really be impacted by, you know, when we'll talk a little bit more um, as we go through our conversations tonight, but, you know, gum disease or gingivitis or gums bleeding, a lot of things that is happening physiologically with a woman's body is impacting their oral health. And we really need to make sure that that's an opportune time that we're seeing our, these patients and can help them to have um, the healthiest mouth they can have. But not only are things happening in the body to change things in the oral cavity, but you got to think also about that time when they're having morning sickness or maybe all day sickness, throwing up, uh, they're having 
um, cravings and they're eating a lot of sugary stuff, which increases their chances for cavities. Um, they're gagging, they're having um, issues with brushing and that's causing them to gag. So just some normal routine things that women, nor that we all do every day, all of a sudden when a woman is pregnant, things are different and it does impact that oral health. So from a dental perspective, wow, we really should be a part of that conversation when a, when a woman is pregnant. Okay, Dr. Palmer. So one of the things that I think is most important is what you captured earlier. Well, let me back up. So the first thing is that oral health and poor oral health specifically can have negative impacts on pregnancy and pregnancy outcomes. And we'll, we'll talk more about this, I think, as we get going. Um, but there's definitely an association with poor oral health and um, pregnancy complications like preterm labor, preterm mature membranes, and small uh, growth restrictor or really small um, babies. And so we know that the inflammation going on in a mouth during a poor oral health time can cause body-wide changes that can negatively impact pregnancy. But Dr. Stokely, what you mentioned earlier, that teachable moment, I think is so very important. Pregnancy is the time that I can get smokers to stop smoking. Mm -hmm. I can get people to stop, um, you know, drinking 17 Dr. Peppers a day. It is really a time when a woman will um, kind of reprioritize her health for the health of her child. And so oral health is just another component in that, and that we can really get somebody into good habits um, who maybe hasn't been to the dentist in several years. But if we can get them back at the door during pregnancy, then that can set them up for success long term as well as their baby. And the other thing that is really important, especially in a state like Texas, where we have a very large number of uninsured young women, is that pregnancy gets them insurance coverage through Medicaid that will pay for their dental care. So when they are not insured and they don't have dental coverage, um, you know, going to the dentist can be really expensive if you're having to pay out of pocket. And so pregnancy is that, um, time when they will have coverage through Medicaid. And so that is a really kind of time to capture. Um, and we, we try to get all that we can done um, during the time course that they're covered, so. Great, thank you, Dr. Palmer. Okay, so now it's time for our first polling question. So I'll read it out, you'll see it on the screen and we'll give you just a moment or two to answer. Polling question number one. Do you think dental procedures are safe for pregnant women? This includes x-rays, fillings with local anesthetic, um, extractions, just kind of the full range of dental procedures. And your choices are yes, no, or not sure. And we'll give you a moment to answer. Okay, let's see what our results are. Great. 92% of you said that you feel that dental procedures are safe for pregnant women, but I still have a sneaking suspicion there's people in the audience that maybe said, I know that's what I'm supposed to say, but I don't know that's what I'm feeling. So that's why we're still going to have these conversations so that we can really get you feeling very confident about that yes that some of you may have just kind of mm, hesitatingly selected. So let's go on. Thank you. You can go ahead and take the question down. So my next question, and it speaks to what I was just saying, that I know there's somebody in the audience, at least one per dentist, who's saying, yeah, 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 I know it's important, blah, 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 but it's my license on the line if there's something that happens with that woman's pregnancy and they think it was dental related. So because of that concern, which I've heard a lot, and I certainly understand the feeling, I want us to kind of go through some procedures one at a time so we can take them and kind of give them each the individual attention that, that they should have for this conversation. Um, so I'm going to name a procedure, and then I want both of you to just kind of give me an answer. I mean, it can be a short yes, safe, no, not safe. I mean, if you want to expand a little bit, you can on that. I'll just leave that up to you. The first one, a full mouth set of x-rays, not just one tooth, this tooth hurts, but somebody's coming in and getting a full set of x-rays. Is that safe? Yes. Yes, it completely <laughs> is safe. We definitely, with, with the technology we have today, 
and the such low radiation that's coming through our x-ray systems nowadays with all of our digital components, um, our lead aprons, including up to the thyroid and covering that baby. Um, it has definitely been shown over and over again to be um, safe, especially even if it is a full mouth set of x-rays. Even in a practice maybe that hasn't yet gone to digital x-rays, is it still safe? Yes. yes. What about fillings? And fillings can come in all different sizes. There can be little bitty tiny ones that you can fill in the blink of an eye, and then there's larger ones that take more work. Are fillings safe? Yes. What if a patient needs three or four of them? Is it okay to get that all done? All the fillings. <laughs> Take care of everything. The, the beauty of taking care of things then when they're small to medium, even larger size fillings, it's better to take care of them before they get out of control and then there is a problem and then we're, we're then we're talking more issues and concerns so taking care of something preventatively so it doesn't get worse with very low exposure to anything from even from local anesthetics but um, it's better to take care of things when it's small and to get rid of that bacteria to get rid of that bacteria that then mom is swallowing every time she swallows because she's got that cavity and that bacteria is floating around in her bloodstream and she doesn't need that at the time. So um, very important. Well, it, you know, I've, I've heard people say, and I've had this mindset, I'll admit in the past, where you think, well, she'll deliver in six months. This, this can wait for six months to get filled. But in all honesty, I don't know about you, I've got two kids it was not on my radar with a newborn to try to go get something like that unless just excruciating pain was driving me out the door. I have a lot of other things on my mind and I'm exhausted. Yes. So really they're not gonna say, oh, I had my baby last week. I'm here for my filling now. I mean, that's just not gonna happen. Nope, that's exactly um, right. That's not reality. <laughs> what about extractions? What about surgical extractions? Third molar giving them problems that's impacted needs to be surgically removed. Is that okay to do? Yes. And everyone listening, the <laughs> OBGYN is saying yes. And even for our dentists knowing, we, we know the procedures, we know what needs to be done dentally. We know what it's going to take to take care of that mom. If that pregnant mom is in need, of a surgical extraction or any kind of extraction, she needs that extraction to decrease the in potential infection, disease process, any kind of problem that can cause her to have extra issues or increase her blood pressure because she's in pain or any of those other kind of the train that gets off the tracks after it's gotten under out of control. So it's, it's less of an issue to take care of it now versus later, um, or to make sure that we're taking care of mom so that baby is the healthiest it can be too. So um, there's less risk to do something like that than to leave it and let it go. Right, yeah, we go don't wanna- Go ahead. Yeah, so we don't wanna let things fester. Um, mm -hmm. You know, of course I'm not a dentist, but I don't imagine that cavities naturally are gonna fill themselves without intervention. And what Dr. Fuquay said was so right that, you know, I have had patients recently who were admitted with, a, with an abscess and were on sepsis watch and, and that's definitely not good for baby and nobody needs to be in the hospital right now, it's COVID. So um, doing all that we can for outpatient preventative treatment is the best idea for mom and baby always. Mm -hmm. You saying that about COVID just made me think just, you know, just in case we're, we may be get asked by a pregnant patient, is the COVID-19 vaccine safe for pregnant women? Oh, thank you for bringing that up. Absolutely. <laughs> a thousand percent. Yes. Um, we are to the point as OBGYNs that we are begging our pregnant people to get it. This new Delta variant has been exceedingly aggressive um, in pregnancy. Being pregnant increases your risk of landing in the ICU by 
uh, times four with the Delta variant. Um, we have had a lot of um, very tragic and unfortunate things happen at a bunch of local hospitals here lately with pregnant and recently postpartum women. So if you are pregnant or considering getting pregnant or if anyone and you haven't had your COVID vaccine and are eligible, please, 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 please go get it because it is, um, it is causing a very significant impact in pregnancy um, and we are seeing really, really, really tragic outcomes. So yes, thank you for that question. And so all of us in the dental community, that's a message that we could help reinforce. Yes. Um, you know, you would think yes. that we're, we're not the experts on that, right? Because we're not their prenatal provider, but just sometimes hearing those additional voices saying, yes, this is something you should do can, can really make the difference to sway someone to do it. Yeah, yeah, we have the safety data. There's no increased risk of adverse perinatal outcomes with the vaccine, so absolutely. I had one last procedure I was gonna ask about, root canals. They're safe too? Safe. Not fun, but safe. <laughs> <laughs> not, not fun, but yes, safe. And, and both, not only does the ADA have, um, you know, literature and information documenting over and over again that it is safe for, for all these procedures we talked about, but so does the American Congress of Obstetricians and Gynecologists state on, especially with the emergent care, they definitely need to have this stuff taken care of. And no matter what trimester, no matter what trimester, if something's happening, th they should get their dental work taken care of. But as we all know, or hopefully know, if not, we're going to remind you, and Dr. Palmer's great about this, that obviously second trimester would be the safest, um, but also probably the most comfortable for th that pregnant mom. So I just yeah, want to throw that in there. Yeah, that golden trimester, that second trimester is really a lovely time to do anything that you can schedule. Um, but um, if for some reason a woman is in her first or third trimester and needs needs care that you wouldn't postpone in somebody who weren't pregnant, they need to go ahead and get that care. Um, there are some comfort measures um, in the third trimester um, that we can talk about, um, about just how to make the dental process and procedures easier and more comfortable during the later stages of pregnancy when we have a lot of belly. Um, but it is absolutely safe to do work throughout the spectrum of pregnancy. Great. Well, and, and so just really trying to get at every possible yeah, but yeah, but situation that someone in the audience might be thinking. Dr. Palmer, is there any type of treatment that you can think of that a dentist should consider postponing or running by a prenatal provider first? I mean, the only thing that I can think of is some cosmetic procedures. Um, if there's, you know, a cosmetic procedure that you're considering, you know, we don't generally recommend things like Botox or, um, you know, facelifts or things like that during pregnancy or breast augmentation. And so a cosmetic dental procedure would, would fall under that guise for me. And so I would say that cosmetic issues are things to not consider. Um, but otherwise, there's really not a thing that I could think of that you that you shouldn't do for a woman who needs it done during pregnancy. All right, great. And Dr. Palmer, I'm going to I just want to say re say what you said, which I loved, is the fact that anything you would do for a patient who wasn't pregnant if they needed it then you would do it for the same reason for that patient that's pregnant so right. i love how you stated that right it, yeah. people just all of a sudden get these blinders on when they're pregnant it's like right oh my god they're pregnant and all of a sudden all common sense of right we forget <laughs> that yeah that mom's actually a person too yeah. that <laughs> deserves to be taken care of just as any other human and we have this, I think, way in our society of like making pregnancy this really kind of um, like special time in that we almost look at it as a disability and we prioritize baby over mom again and again and again in society. But if we don't have a healthy mom, we can't have a healthy kid. You know, I have pregnant women come in all the time. Is it okay if I use my inhaler? Honey, if you're not breathing, baby's not getting oxygen. So we have to start prioritizing mom as patient one, because if we don't take care of mom, we're not taking care of baby. So. Very well said. Thank you, Dr. Palmer. I love that. Dr. Fuquay, 
and, and I think you kind of touched on this some in the introduction. So you may, or in the first question, so you may just want to fill in any little gaps perhaps, but for the non-dental people in our audience, um, can you describe to them the consequences of postponing dental care? What happens so, when someone has a problem and they don't go get it treated in a timely manner? Yes. So obviously if someone is having a dental problem and they're not taking care of it in that timely manner or when that's bothering them and it gets worse, we've already talked about that's not good, right? Things just progressively will get worse. Gingivitis or, uh, and, and somebody could not have had any problems before um, they got pregnant. Um, they could have been in fine dental health, but all of a sudden they're pregnant and the pregnancy hormones take over and stuff starts happening potentially to patients. So you can have, you know, gingivitis, that gum disease, the swollen gums. Um, you can actually start getting um, oral health issues that you maybe never even had before. Um, so I do want to remind people, this is not just patients that maybe already had something, now they're pregnant and maybe we need to address it. This also impacts patients who have never even had a cavity, never even had oral health issues, and now they're pregnant and because of everything going on, now all of a sudden they're having dental issues or oral health issues. Um, gingivitis, gum disease, swollen gums, bleeding gums. Um, uh, if a patient is telling you that they're having bad breath or you know something's hurting in their mouth, something's going on, that's going to increase um, their chances of potentially um, a premature birth, maybe giving birth before that 37 weeks. Um, if someone's got periodontal or more advanced gingivitis that has now gone into periodontal disease, their, their chances increase even more for uh, premature birth, even before 32 weeks. Um, you can have low birth weight babies. Dr. Palmer already mentioned that as well. If mom is not the healthiest she can be, and remember everything that's happening with mom at that time, it's going to the baby, right? The body's trying to send everything good and help that baby to grow and be healthy as it can be. And mom all of a sudden maybe isn't getting, the body's not able to fight that bacteria that's in the mouth. So things may get worse faster in her um, than it would in a perfectly healthy unpregnant female right so we have to remember that those are things that are um, that can be a factor and can be an issue um, and, and even more reason not to delay care because in pregnancy again like, like you mentioned the immune system is dampened um, we know that we're more susceptible to every you know virus that comes around. We know that um, the flu, for example, is where some women were learning so much about COVID in this respect as well. Um, but it takes longer for a pregnant woman to fight off a bacterial or viral infection because their immune system is turned down. So they don't attack this growing kid inside of them as a foreign invader. It's by design. Um, and so again, even more reason to not hesitate to address these things as they come up because they could potentially turn, um, you know, more dangerous, more quickly than and somebody who was not pregnant. Great. Thank you. So now we're going to focus on some different medications, the safety of medications, local anesthetics. Um, same thing, I'll name some things and then you just let me know if it's safe or not. Local anesthetics with or without epinephrine. Yes. Both are fine. And Both one are fine. One thing I would like to elaborate is I know that some dentists think or feel um, that, you know, maybe I shouldn't use epinephrine. Uh, maybe I shouldn't, you know, and that's fine. But as y'all see, the expert, the OBGYN is saying it is okay to use epinephrine. But bottom line is for the dentist, if you cannot get profound anesthesia, you cannot get something numb because you're, you're trying to avoid and be careful, you may be inadvertently giving them more anesthetic anyway than if you would have used something with epinephrine and then you're getting profound anesthesia so they're getting really numb and you're able to take care of them. So remember and weigh those consequences. It, 
could be worse if you just used what you thought needed to be used to begin with to get a really good numb tooth to work on. So just wanted to throw that extra in. What about um, medications like antibiotics or pain medications? Yeah, so there's definitely a handful of antibiotics that we don't want to use in pregnancy. Um, but I, you know, these are fairly common that we, you know, both on both sides of the spectrum that we know this, we don't want to use the fluoroquinolones, we want to avoid doxycycline. Everything else is fair game, your penicillins, your cephalosporins, um, clindamycin, all of those are completely appropriate from an antibiotic standpoint. Um, it was funny, I had a patient in recently, and she was talking about getting a dental procedure. And so I'd given her our standard note that we write, she goes, I mean, I appreciate that you write these all out, but can't they just Google it? <laughs> <laughs> so if all else fails, safety and pre pregnancy uh, safety categories are easy to Google. Um, <laughs> but again, penicillin, cephalosporins, clindamycin are all fine. Um, from a pain medicine standpoint, please, please, please do not withhold pain medicine from a patient just because she's pregnant. Um, again, that's just mean. Um, but uh, narcotics sparingly are fine. Um, you know, whether it's Norco or Tylenol 3 or whatever you guys tend to prescribe. We do want to avoid anti-inflammatories like Motrin, and naproxen, um, especially after 28 weeks, but your standard Tylenol combo pain meds are perfectly um, safe to do. All right. What about nitrous? Oh, my favorite question. Yes, nitrous <laughs> is safe. Um, so I always remind people that we use nitrous as pain medicine in labor and delivery. It's one of our modalities of pain relief that we offer during labor. So we but certainly- But someone would say though, Dr. Palmer, <laughs> yeah, but that, the baby's about to the come. Baby's about to so be, that doesn't but not, matter. But not for hours. And we know <laughs> how quickly nitrous is cleared from our system, right? Like it's not a really long acting um, medication. And so um, the, the concern for nitrous came from studies back, um, I think in the 60s, before modern day nitrous scavenging systems were instituted. And Dr. Bugley could definitely talk more eloquently about that. But it was found that actually women who were pregnant who worked in dental offices that were around high volumes of nitrous had increased risk of miscarriage. So this is where the scare about nitrous has come from. And so to that matter, I would say if you could avoid nitrous in the first trimester, everybody would probably feel more comfortable with that. With that. But in the second and the third trimester, we don't have any data to show that nitrous administered the way that it is and the systems that we use now have any kind of um, effect on um, uh, miscarriage or preterm labor or any other bad outcomes. Yeah. And, and I would just follow that up with for anyone who is hesitant to use nitrous and maybe you're more hesitant to use it for a whole hour or an hour and a half for a procedure. A lot of times you find that if you can get the patient through the injection, getting them numb, for whatever the procedure is you're gonna do. And then you turn that nitrous off, put it on 100% oxygen. And all you did was use that nitrous to get them through that scare or that uneasiness of the injection. Usually when someone's numb, they really don't care what you do to them, they're numb. So most of the time, if it's a fearful patient, um, they're just um, anxious, uh, you know, whatever thing you want, or you already know, they've already told you, doc, I'm scared of needles. Well, okay, we're going to numb you up, but we're going to do everything we can. Then you can talk about the nitrous and maybe that's another option for people to do. Remember, it doesn't have to stay on the entire time and you can use it for periods of time just to get them through whatever step that is. Here's another fearful patient question. What if pre-pregnancy you had a patient that, you know, was fearful of the appointment, kind of the whole appointment, and so you would routinely have them take a benzodiazepine like triazolam or something. Well, then they come in during pregnancy and need some work. Is it still okay to give them something like that to get the work completed? Again, sparing use, it's like our narcotics. We don't want them to take it every day, um, but in the second or third trimester, completely appropriate for a one-time benzodiazepine dose um, 
I mean, it's in a similar situation, we give that to women in labor sometimes who are, um, you know, getting anxious um, uh, for one reason or another, and we don't want them using it all the time. Um, but, uh, you know, a one time dose to get through a dental procedure, I'm not worried about that. Okay, great. And remember, we don't want them to get in pain and then have their blood pressure being increased. And, you know, that domino effect of more things happening because you let them just go and be right. in pain. Yeah. So now it's time for our second polling question for the audience. And this is directed uh, specifically to the dentists who are in our audience. Would you feel comfortable scheduling a pregnant patient for two class twos that's two moderate sized fillings for the non-dental folks in the audience using local anesthetic with epinephrine without first getting the prenatal provider's approval. And your choices to that are yes, no, or I'm not sure. We'll give you a moment to answer. Okay, let's see what we've got. 43% of you say yes, 29% say no, and 29% are not sure which is kind of around the answers that I kind of expected. I expected something like that. that I, don't, I don't know about Dr. Fuquay or Dr. Palmer, but that doesn't really surprise me to see. So, okay, so 43% yes, and the rest, uh, no, either not sure or heck no. So that kind of leads um, to this next question that I'll, I'll pose to both of you. Um, we know from a survey that we conducted of Texas dentists um, three years ago that 54% in that survey said that they would not provide dental care to a pregnant patient without the prenatal provider's consent. Do you think a medical clearance by the prenatal provider is necessary? Um, I'll have Dr. Palmer answer that first and then Dr. Fuquay, if you have anything to add. You're not gonna be shocked that my, <laughs> my answer is no. I, you know, I think as, again, as. As obstetricians, we understand and realize that everybody is scared of our patients when they're pregnant, but as obstetricians, we're begging you to not be scared of them. They are just, in fact, people with a uterus who have to have some, who happen to have something else inside there. Um, we have to take care of mom, period, end of sentence. And it is really, um, you know, we, we provide, of course, the clearance for all sorts of specialties. And you're not, you're not alone, dentists, like the, the orthopedists <laughs> are this way, and the neurologists are this way. I had to sign for my patient to have an MRI of her brain without contrast the other day. There's like zero radiation in that. And, um, but you know, again, I signed it because they, they, she needs to have it taken care of. Um, but we just want our patients to be seen and taken care of as patients who happen to be pregnant. Um, and so our, our hope and goal would be that everybody knows kind of the set of rules of the things that are allowed, which is everything that you need to do, the medications that you need to give, which is most of those you would usually give, and just treat them like they would treat them if they weren't pregnant, treat them like they need to be treated. Um, so my, my answer would be that no, you don't have to have our consent. Well, and I would guess my worry would be, you know, kind of thinking what someone in the audience might be thinking is, but how do I know that that patient if it isn't having some horribly complicated pregnancy with all kinds of problems that could be problematic? How do I know she's not just your garden variety, healthy pregnant patient? You know, if they're that horribly complicated, they're probably going to be in the hospital. Um, and I will tell you that most patients who are truly a high-risk pregnancy wear that like a badge of honor. They're going to tell you all about it. Um, but, you know, just some reasonable questions. Are you having any complications in your pregnancy? Are you taking any high blood pressure medication? Um, you know, would go a long way um, just to kind of screen people in and out. And like, I know when I go to the dentist, I always get my blood pressure taken. And certainly if a patient has a severe blood pressure of like 160 over 110 or higher, then you go, you should go to the hospital instead of doing this today. <laughs> um, you know, that would certainly be a reason to kind of halt a procedure. But again, a patient with a normal blood pressure, like who is, um, you know, appears well and states that she has no problems with her pregnancy. Um, you know, I would, I would take that at face value and, and yeah. uh, wouldn't hesitate. I, I will concur with Dr. Palmer. I mean, for the dentists that are on the call today, you know, we 
we are trained, we are equipped to ask questions and make decisions. There are a bajillion other medical issues out there that we ask patients, you need to do a thorough medical history review. Ask them these questions. It's just like when I ask them when they put nothing, there's nothing written for medications. I'm like, <laughs> are you not taking prenatal vitamins? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, oh, and then they start listing out all this stuff they do. So you, I always ask if there's nothing. Okay, so, oh, you're only taking two medications? And this is for any patient. doesn't even need to be the pregnant patient. But for the pregnant patient, you're going to ask all those questions. Well, have you ever had any bleeding issues? If you haven't seen this patient before, ever, you're going to ask those normal questions. Did you ever have any problems with dental work before? Did you ever have any? You're going to ask the questions that would get answered that you would need to know to appropriately treat that patient, any regular patient. So now they're pregnant. Okay, you may ask a few more. How's the pregnancy going? What trimester are you in? Have you had any difficulties? Oh yes, I've been throwing up a lot. I've been really sick. I have a, I've never had a gag grief. Now I really do. Oh, as a dentist, I wanna know that you're really gagging a lot. I don't want you throwing up on me, right? Like I, there are so many questions that we normally ask on a regular basis. You know, is there any chance you could be pregnant before we take x-rays? So even if you're not pregnant, we're asking women all the time. So I, I, I know that Dr. Palmer and I may seem very cavalier sort of in a way about this conversation of a pregnant woman, but we've been talking about it together for the last several years. And so we are here to say, don't be scared. We need these patients taken care of and we want the best outcomes for our pregnant mom and that baby. So we wouldn't be saying, yes, please go ahead and do it. But we always know we can do that default note, right? That default, you know what? Let's get through everything today. Let's find out what you need. Let's do a full exam. And then I'll get clearance from your OBGYN. If that makes you feel more comfortable, please do it so we can get that patient treated. And the thing about the, the note that I would just like everyone to kind of remember and to take into consideration, if you have the time and the opportunity to address the filling or whatever needs to be done, um, you know, many of my patients, specifically many of my Medicaid patients have a lot of trouble with transportation. And so just so consider the burden that you're asking of them to leave your office, to go to my office, to get a note, and then to come back to your office at a later date. Um, you know, for people who struggle with transportation, for people who, um, you know, have kids that they need to have watched because it's COVID and they can't bring them to my office and I know they can't bring them to yours either. Um, for people who really struggle to find time to take off work at a time when they're already having to take off more than usual to come to their prenatal visits to really just kind of bring your humanity in the picture and, and, and put yourself in their shoes for a minute of what kind of burden is it going to be for me to, you know, stay and do this now when you have time to do it and versus to come back later just for the sake of a note. We're going to go now to polling question number three. And this question is directed to our prenatal providers in the audience. What does your practice do to promote oral health as a part of prenatal health? And we want you to check all that apply. Your choices are, we ask dental questions in the patient health history. We ask screening questions about oral health during one of the prenatal visits. We include oral health information in prenatal packets. We refer our pregnant patients to a dentist. We don't do anything related to oral health at our practice. I'm not sure what we do about oral health in our practice. So take a moment and select all that apply. Okay, let's see our results. I'm not sure. Well, and that's not really a surprise, right? I mean, there, there's a lot, of, a lot of people that make the practice work. You can go ahead and take the results down. So you may not necessarily know exactly what goes on, you know, at the various stages of where 
people in a prenatal office can touch that pregnant woman um, and, and speak to her or interact with her about oral health. Um, so Dr. Palmer, this leads me to my next question. What, what do you think most prenatal providers do? I mean, just the, what do y'all do in your sure. office or colleagues that you know um, do regarding oral health? I would say that, you know, across the country, across, um, you know, just generally, that we don't do enough. Um, I don't think that, you know, there's so many things to address and so many things to try to prioritize um, during pregnancy that this is just one of the many items of, you know, general health that we need to, to prioritize and to put on our list of things to really kind of pay attention to that probably gets kind of down on the bottom of the list more often than not. Um, one thing, and I know Dr. Fuqua and I have talked about this over the pandemic is that we are not even seeing their mouths anymore. Um, where pre-COVID, I could look at a patient and even if I forgot to ask, at, you know, our initial visit when the last time she went to the dentist was, if I can look at her dentition and go, ooh, when's the last time you saw a dentist? Um, you know, just that very obvious, like from across the room, um, evidence that she needs to probably get some help with her oral health. We're not getting that anymore because we are not seeing our patients unmasked. And so it has fallen, I think, even further to the bottom of the list because we're not even getting that incidental, um, hey, you need to go see a dentist uh, kind of discussion in. Um, and so uh, what we do at my practice and um, what I would encourage everybody else to do is to make it part of your routine new OB intake. Um, so this is a time when we're going over their complete health history. We're going over their obstetric history. We're going over their gynecologic history. We're going over their surgical history. We're going over their, um, their medicines, their allergies, all these things. We just need to add it to that list. Um, when was your last pap smear? Great. We're going to do that next. When's the last time you saw a dentist? Great. Here's a referral. You haven't been three years. Um, and so we just need to make that part of our routine standard questions um, that we ask when we're taking a complete comprehensive history. Because as Dr. Fuqua mentioned at the beginning, we, you know, we don't associate this with the rest of our health. And we really need to make sure that we're, that we're making that connection, and not only for us, but for our patients. Thank you, Dr. Palmer. So that concludes my Q&A for the panelists. Um, before we move to taking audience questions, um, I want to make sure that you're aware of some resources um, that we have developed. You know, we, we covered a lot of information this evening, and it would be really nice, right, to have that in writing that you can refer back to. We have developed a practice guidance um, for prenatal and dental providers. It's got information for both. Um, and you'll see a link to that in the chat box. You can go to our program website to find it. Um, you can just, if, you know, if, if all else fails and you can't think of, oh, what was the website? You can just Google Texas DSHS oral health or dental or something and, and we'll pop up. In our, uh, on our website, there is a page called Smiles for Moms and Babies. And within that is information for prenatal and dental providers. You'll find the practice guidance that I'm talking about. It's got all the information about different pharmacological considerations um, along the lines of what Dr. Palmer was saying, you know, chair positioning that can make um, a third trimester dental visit more comfortable for that patient. Um, and a lot of other information, really good stuff, really good clinical photos. It, it's really, we're really proud of it. Um, and we hope you find it useful. There's, it's part of a toolkit as well, um, which also has the pharmacological chart where it's easy to tape up, say in a cabinet door, your operatory for reference, um, do with it as you like, some various checklists, um, just a lot of good um, resources. So you can click on the link, I see it in the chat box now, and look at those items. If you would like to request a hard copy of the um, toolkit or just the practice guidance alone, you can email us. You can email our program email address, um, which I believe is going to be going, yep, there it is in the chat box now, dental at dshs.texas spelled out.gov. 
So also on there, you'll find other resources. Um, the statement that I think maybe Dr. Fuquay alluded to, um, there's a statement from the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists where it says from them, how the importance of dental care and how it should not be delayed. So lots of useful information there. So that can help you feel more comfortable. You've got something to point back to, um, to help, you know, um, what am I trying to say? Justify your treatment. It's based on science. Here it is. So with that, we are going to go now to some questions from the audience. And so again, we can do this two different ways. Um, type them in the Q&A box. I'll, I'll try to keep an eye on the chat box too, but it's kind of a lot to do both. So type your questions in the Q&A box. And if you would like to ask your questions, right, because we all want to stand up in the front of the room and ask, right, um, you can raise your hand and I'll call on you, we'll unmute you, and then you can ask your question. So either way, but be thinking of those questions now. Let me go ahead and see what we've got. Ooh, good question. Um, is it safe to breastfeed after getting local anesthetic? Oh, that's a fabulous question. And absolutely yes is the answer. Um, and breastfeeding, um, you know, actually from the dental standpoint, like broadens the things that you can do. Um, there's uh, some of the antibiotics are fine to give, like fluoroquinolones, for example, are fine at breastfeeding where they're, you know, not in pregnancy. And so, um, yeah, breastfeeding, um, you know, just the extension of pregnancy that still makes everybody nervous. Um, there's no reason to, um, to, yeah, not give local anesthetic. Again, not give pain medication if we need it. You think about moms who've just had a C-section, they get pain medicine and they can breastfeed their babies. And so um, same would hold um, for any kind of dental procedure. There's no need for moms to pump and dump. There's no need to um, waste any of that liquid precious gold. Um, and yeah, no, feed, feed your baby. That's totally fine. Great question. Good, good to know. Let's see if we have any others. I'm also trying to look through. <laughs> I appreciate this comment from Keon. I totally agree. Treat the moms. <laughs> Thank you. Let's see, any other questions? And let me see if there was anything else. How do you think we can improve communications between prenatal and dental providers? I mean, you know, everybody's busy, right? What, what's the best way to try to, you know, establish maybe a referral relationship or, or just get on the same page in terms of oral prenatal health? Well, I mean, I would, I think, you know, ideally we would love as obstetricians, um, because again, so many of our patients who may not have insurance coverage um, really kind of struggle to find dentists sometimes um, who will take their Medicaid or who, when they're not insured, will work with them on cash pay pricing. Cash pay pricing. Um, and so I think from us, just from the obstetric standpoint, like having a, a good group of dentists who we know are willing to work on pregnant people and um, willing to kind of work with um, the financial structure of that as well um, would be, would be um, you know, super helpful. And I know that's part of what we're trying to do here with the Oral Health Coalition is to establish these kind of relationships and these kind of um, resources for, for you know, both sides of um, the equation here. Yeah, agree. As far as the referral process, I don't think as dentists, we seem, I don't think we are going to be referring to the OBG very much. It doesn't go that direction. Typically, they don't come in for a dental appointment and they're yeah. like, oh, I think I'm pregnant. <laughs> Where did I go? That doesn't typically happen. Uh, women usually have gone to the OBGYN or are planning to go. Um, and most of the time, a lot of times women will say, I took a pregnancy test at home. I'm pregnant, but I haven't had my first appointment with the OBGYN. Those kinds of things happen. But typically it's going to be the OBGYNs. It's going to be crucial to be really referring them to dentists. And as dentists, we need to make ourselves known in the community that we're willing to treat those pregnant patients and that we are interested and get to know your community partners, cross collaborate, do interdisciplinary education, 
think outside the box, you know, our medical providers should be maybe looking at some dental type of meetings or lectures and dentists doing the same to look at and feel more comfortable because Dr. Palmer and I had already been speaking for a while on, yes, it's safe. Yes, it's safe. Yes, it's safe. And then Dr. Stokely did a poll and it was like, oh yeah, but I still don't feel comfortable. Yeah. So yeah, it's hard to unlearn those things that either you're taught directly or yeah. you kind of pick up on in dental school, no matter how long ago dental school was, it's hard to shake some of that. Yes. Um, Dr. Fuquay, tell me about Cook Children's Coordinated Care for Pregnant Teens and Women program. Oh, so excited you asked that. Dr. Palmer even touched on that. That's why Dr. Palmer and I even know each other. <laughs> so really what we've been seeing with the Children's Oral Health Coalition, which has been going on for well over 20 years, the goal is to keep kids healthy, right? And, and, and to do that with their oral health. We've just seen so many kids coming through the emergency room or needing dental care in an OR setting because they're two and three years old. Our pediatric dentists are just overwhelmed with the amount of, of dental care that kids are carries, kids are getting. So what did we do? We thought we've got to start way upstream before that baby's even born. And what does that mean? Well, mom can only bring in that help baby healthy if she's healthy. Like Dr. Palmer said, it's got to stay, it's got to start with mom. And if she's healthy and we can pre-educate her on how to bring that baby into, into the world, the healthiest it can be, including their oral health with that overall health, then those referrals can also then be made from the pediatrician to the pediatric dentist and really making sure that our kiddos are being seen earlier than later. Um, and again, there's a misnomer there with general dentist going, oh, well, let's, yeah, your, your kid, do you see a dentist by age three? No, it's age one or before. Um, so, you know, getting over that, that's why our coordinated care for pregnant teens and women really got going. And we have, unfortunately, in our school districts around here, Fort Worth, Arlington, you know, H-E-B Keller, our bigger districts, they have hundreds of pregnant teenagers. That's a very vulnerable population to begin with. So we really need to be working with them. And that's why Dr. Palmer's even talking all about the, the Medicaid, they're actually covered and let's get these kids in here, the transportation, there's a lot of issues. Um, and so that's why our Children's Oral Health Coalition braced around this whole concept of coordinated care for pregnant teens and women. Let's get the word out. Let's take care of these pregnant teens and women so that their babies can be the healthiest they can be. So Dr. Fuquay, if someone in your area wanted to get involved with the program, how would they go about doing that? Oh my goodness, they need to get in, they need to contact Elaine Vivens, who you see her beautiful face on the screen and her email address there. Um, we'll put in the chat um, their information, but we can you can go um, to our website or even Googling in if you forget anything or can't remember, even just Googling that Cook Children's and Oral Health. Cook Children's, this coordinated care pregnant teens, it will come up. Um, please get involved with our Children's Oral Health Coalition. We really have um, been fortunate enough to have wonderful folks like Dr. Palmer and her team and her staff who are really vested in oral health. And we really need to be cross collaborating like this um, for our patients, right? Um, it's, we got to take the blinders off and really take care of the whole person now. Um, I just want to say thank you again to Dr. Fuquay and Dr. Palmer. Um, I'd like to give both of you a moment to just give a quick, you know, quick closing words, take home message, just keep it short and sweet so we can wrap up on time. And we'll start with you, Dr. Fuquay. Yes, I, I would just like to say thank you for everyone that's on the call. It means you're interested you wanna know what's going on and you wanna be doing the right things for your patients. So thank you for that. Continue this conversation. Send people to the Department of State Health Services website. This video will be on there. Share this with your partners, with your colleagues, um, so we can get the word out and really start, and maybe even our patients, 
even our patients can hear this and an OBGYN and a dentist talking about the safety. Um, I know Dr. Palmer was trying to answer a question about how do you convince a patient that's maybe hesitant, maybe watching stuff like this, send them this direction, not to Dr. Google. <laughs> that's my closing remark. <laughs> Um, and I'll apologize. My copy and paste pasted um, my children's chore list of uh, giving the dogs <laughs> medicine and scooping the cat poop. Um, so sorry about that one. I was trying to answer the gestational diabetes question. You don't need to screen them more often, just routine. Um, but, you know, I, I just really think that this is, um, again, an opportunity to have a really positive impact um, on a woman's overall health and just implore um, all of you non-obstetricians out there to really just think about treating the mom as the mom needs to be treated um, and try to um, give, give her that same understanding and um, that same attention. Uh, that you would give to somebody who weren't pregnant. If you wouldn't blow them off and tell them to come back in six months to fill a cavity, don't blow the pregnant lady off and tell her to come back in six months after she's delivered. And Dr. Stokely was so correct. Life doesn't get easier after that baby comes out. They're just going to get more, um, you know, more busy and more distracted and and deprioritize themselves more, as I think most moms tend to do. So let's take care of it when it comes up. Um, and we are always happy to answer questions. Again, we will sign your consent forms. We will give all the blessings that we need to give, um, but uh, just let's take care of mamas. And part, I, I, I apologize. I'm gonna try to squeeze in one more question. I see that we had someone in the audience that had raised their hand and I think I had accidentally overlooked them. Um, so it's, it's just listed on here as Kay Burdett. So we're going to unmute you, Kay, um, and if you could quickly ask your question and we'll see if we can get an answer in before we wrap up. Hello, everyone. It's uh, Karen Burdett. Uh, I have a just, well, I don't know if it's really quick, but um, let's just say, for instance, if you have a patient who comes in and they've gone through um, IVF, and they said, well, you know, I've missed, you know, like my period. I don't know if I'm pregnant, but um, I'm here with a toothache. I know all the guidelines. I understand them. Um, but I know that IVF is very sensitive. Um, I'm still concerned about mom. Yes, I'm concerned about baby. What is the best way to handle that? Should I still, I mean, yes, they're a person. Still treat them the same way? I, I don't know. I just feel... That's just a question that's come up and thought I would just get some more guidance on that. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, IVF pregnancies are um, so emotional to start with because those parents have um, invested a lot of time and money and emotional energy um, into achieving their pregnancy. Um, and so I think a lot of moms who do have IVF are kind of inherently a little more nervous, um, although not across the board. Um, there's plenty of really nervous moms out there who got there the old fashioned way. Um, but it is um, perfectly safe. There's no increased risk for, like once that pregnancy is established, um, there's no increased risk and nothing that you're gonna do um, is going to increase the risk of the pregnancy not implanting um, or anything along those lines. And just like everything else, if we let it go and we let it fester and we increase our inflammation, we increase the bacterial burden, um, that is going to be worse off for a developing pregnancy than the, you know, a few cc's of lidocaine with epi and whatever you need to do to them. So, all right. And so we will have to leave it there. Thank you again to the panelists. Thank you to everyone who attended and asked questions. Um, stay tuned for the opportunity to register for our next session, which is going to be on Wednesday, October 20th. Thank you, everybody, and good night.